Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we're just so thankful for uh, another day uh, in your creation. Uh, as rainy as it may be, we know that it's needed for the growth, and we're just so thankful that we get to come together and uh, worship you and learn about you and be together as a family. Just uh, be with us today. Uh, just, um, I pray that the words that are going to come from my mouth are from you and not from me. I pray that you will just uh, open our hearts and our minds and prepare us and uh, just give us a great holiday weekend and uh, just spending time with the ones we love. I pray for our church family as they're traveling, um, those who couldn't be here today, just uh, be with them as well. And uh, we love you, Father, and we pray. Amen. So we're taking a, uh, a little break from Ecclesiastes. I know you're bummed out about that, um, but um, we're going to take a break today, and uh, we're actually going to get really super topical. As you can tell, uh, our title is Memorials. I don't know why we picked Memorials for this weekend, but um, just, you know, throughout Scripture, we see people uh, in the Bible uh, raising memorials. Uh, what's the importance of the memorials? What do they mean for us? What is a memorial? Uh, why did people in the Bible make these memorials? Uh, are there memorials in your life? Uh, and how does those things point us ultimately to the gospel? Um, one of my favorite uh, songs that we sing, I actually asked Corey to do today, even though we did it two weeks ago, and that was Come Thou Fount. And um, I, I love the, the words of the song, and I was actually... Um, I quoted the, the song in a little talk I was giving a couple years back at this like, you know, men's meeting. And you know, I just couldn't help but get emotional. I, I started kind of like welling up. And I always thought it would take more than that to make me cry in front of a room full of men. But um, needless to say, um, the song is so powerful. But there's a word in particular that always kind of jumped out at me. And I don't know if you feel the same way. But there's a word in the second verse. Um, and the, the line goes like this. It says, here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. Uh, what the heck is an Ebenezer? Um, this is actually a reference to a verse in 1 Samuel. And in that verse, um, the prophet um, had built a memorial to commemorate a moment where God protected the people from an attack of the Philistines. And he called it Ebenezer. And so throughout various hymns like this one, that's their reference to memorials. This, this idea of raising your Ebenezer. And so I wanted to kind of think about that and understand you know, what that means, this idea of memorials and ceremonies, and it just worked out really well that this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And over the course of their history, um, the Israelites made many of these um, memorials, and the reason they made them uh, was to remember. And so I kept thinking about that word remember, and I wanted to know, I was curious, I didn't know how many times that word occurred in, in, in Scripture, namely the Old Testament, so I researched it. And the Old Testament Hebrew lexicon, as translated into the American Standard Version of the Bible, uh, has the word remember occurring 221 times. Um, the Hebrew word is actually zakar, and it's used to describe uh, remembering, uh, recalling, to make memorial or make remembrance. And although the nation of Israel um, over their history made many of these, I just want to focus on one of these memorials that actually occurs more than once in Scripture. It pops up a couple times. Now, tomorrow is Memorial Day, um, and I think that this is probably, I was talking to Rich this morning about it, I think this might actually be my fifth Memorial Day um, preaching. So it's another holiday weekend. For those of you who are new here, uh, we started calling these holiday weekends because um, when Jeremy gets to go on vacation, I get to step in and do this. And I'm so happy to be here on another one. Um, now, tomorrow's Memorial Day. And so um, not only is it um, a day where we can um, start hanging our American flags up and get excited for the start of summer and plan our barbecues, but it's also a very important day. Um, it was actually started in the late 1800s, Memorial Day. Uh, the Civil War, uh, which had ended in the spring of 1865, um, claimed more lives than any conflict in um, American history. And as a matter of fact, um, it was because of that massive loss that required the establishment of national cemeteries. Up until that point, we didn't have national cemeteries. So um, what started happening uh, is that by the late 1860s, Americans in various cities and towns started having springtime tributes for the fallen soldiers. They would sing songs, they would share poems, they would decorate graves with flowers, things like that. And it became known as Decoration Day for quite a while. And so Memorial Day is a day for us to remember the men and women who have died in service to our country. 
Um, we remember them and we tell their stories. And actually, if it weren't for them, we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about them right now. Uh, as we know, a lot of places around the world, you can't meet like this. And so that's why we're so fortunate to live in this country. But today, uh, in the theme of remembering and memorials um, and their significance in Scripture, um, I just wanted to bring this one up. So do me a favor. Um, open your Bibles or your Bible apps to Joshua chapter 4. Um, at this point um, in the history of Israel, um, God has delivered the people out of Egypt. Uh, the Bible tells us, actually, um, they left Egypt 430 years to the day that they arrived. And if you don't believe me, that's in Exodus, Exodus 12, 41. It says 430 years to the day. I thought that was interesting. Um, so now, at this point, Moses has died. Um, Joshua has been charged with leading the people uh, by God. And uh, so Josh here is the commander-in-chief of, of Israel, the nation of Israel. And uh, this is finally the point when they get to enter into the promised land. That's where we are right now. Um, now, in my mind, this pattern of um, forgetfulness and remembrance is highlighted in no better than with the people of Israel. You'll recall that Moses' whole time as leader was peppered with the people complaining and grumbling about being in the desert and, you know, where's our food going to come from and where are we going? And they were just complaining. And they were even saying at times they wish they were back in Egypt. It's crazy how soon they forgot. Now, if you've grown up in the church um, as I have, you know that it's very easy to bash the Israelites for being such complainy complainersons. But I, I won't speak for you, but I'll speak for myself. No, no. No, no, I will speak for you because I know you guys, and I know that you would be complaining too. You and I would be complaining too. If we had to walk around the desert for 40 years eating manna every day, we'd be complaining too. Um, but I know that it's easy to just shake our heads at them and say, oh, how could you? But, you know, how many grumbling voices do you hear on an airplane when the Wi-Fi or the movie system has to get restarted? You've been on the airplane, right? And they're like, sorry, we have to reset the Wi-Fi. And everyone's like, oh. Like, how soon we forget that. Like, air travel used to be staticky headphones with, like, two radio stations. Uh, if there was a screen, it was probably ten rows up, and you would, you know, I would play with the ashtrays, flipping the ashtrays open and closed on the armrest. Remember that on airplanes? It's just me? Anyway. All that to say, we forget, okay? We, we forget that air travel was very different, and we get very comfortable. Um, so, <laughs> anyway. When God promised the people this land of Canaan and Moses sent the, the spies out, you remember the 12 spies, well, 10 of them came back and were saying, hey, we can't, we can't do this. The land is occupied by giants. 10 of those 12 discouraged the rest. And as a matter of fact, it was because of those, those 10 and that, and that doubt. That's why they had to wander around. It's not that Moses was lost. He didn't, he didn't you know, not bring a map. Um, as a matter of fact, um, in Numbers, Moses records for us what happened. Uh, the, it says here, and I quote, The Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. It was because of the doubt of those ten that they had to wander around. So anyway, the wandering is now uh, culminated to them arriving at the Jordan River. And you have to remember that not all of the people who have arrived here at the river even got to see the parting of the Red Sea. And if they did, they were probably too young to remember it because all that time has passed. The whole generation had died out. And so they have always had manna and quail. They don't know what life was like in captivity. They've only known wandering about in the desert. And so, you know, even, even Moses himself didn't get to go in. He didn't get to enter in there. And he was there for all of it. He raised his arms up. He saw the Red Sea part. He saw his staff turn into a snake. He saw all the miracles. And even he, God talked to him in a burning bush. Like he, he was there for all of it. And even he blew it. He lost his opportunity. Now, Joshua's was in charge. And to get to where they're going, like I mentioned, they have to cross the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River, um, I was trying to figure out how big it is or was. And what I could come up with is that the Jordan River it was, it was roughly 100 feet across and as deep as 10 feet, okay? And that might not sound as big as you thought it was, but think about moving 2 million people across a river that's 100 feet wide and 10 feet deep. That's, that's pretty difficult to do. I mean, 
Have you ever tried to get 10 people to agree on a restaurant to go to together? That's, that's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot easier than 2 million people going across the river. I digress. So the Lord instructed Joshua. We're getting to Joshua 4, by the way. I know you guys are just thinking, wait, I turned to Joshua 4. Keep your thumbnail. We're getting there. The Lord instructed Joshua that the Levite priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant were supposed to step down into the waters, and that when they did that, when their feet were firmly on the riverbed, the waters would recede, and then everyone could cross over. Um, and once the people crossed, the priests were supposed to go back in front of them with the Ark and carry on to the other side. And that's when the waters would come back together to their flooding levels which is what I failed to mention earlier, the waters of the Jordan. Not only is it a big river, 100 feet across, 10 feet deep, but at this point in the story, at this point of the year, it's overflowing. It's flooding its banks. So it's, it's a little chaotic. So Joshua 4, you got to bear with me. This is a little long. We're going to get through it together, okay? Now, it starts like this. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man. And command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. Time out a second. He says, take up a stone on your shoulder. We're not talking about like a little baseball-sized stone here. We're talking about like big. Like picture more like that Poland spring bottle out there in the lobby. That's about the size. I tried to find a good picture of it, but that's the best I can come up with. That's probably a little bigger than that even. But So picture a Poland spring bottle, okay? Try digging one of those out of the riverbed, hoisting it up on your shoulder, and carrying it to where you're going to lodge. That's, if you've got a, a, a picture. Verse 6, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Memorials are a reminder. Verse 8. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. He didn't say pick up the stones and place them next to the river. He said pick them up and carry them where you're going to camp out. Verse 9, And Joshua set up the twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and there the art of this day. For the priests bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything that was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste, all two million of them. And when all the people had finished passing over, the Ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Verse 19, the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Do you want to know how far they carried those rocks? The suspense is killing you. So based on, on my estimate, because there's a couple locations Gilgal could have been, but based on most of the information we have about where Gilgal was um, in relation to Jericho, in relation to the river, they carried the rocks almost 40 miles. So imagine digging one of those bottles full out of a riverbed, putting it on your shoulder, and walking to JFK Airport. 
That's about how far they had to travel with those rocks. Verse 21. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. We made it. Okay. The stones that they pulled out of the Jordan and that Joshua set up did three things. These are the three things that I want us to kind of think about today. So memorials, they remind us. We see that memorials are reminders. Memorials are often born out of struggle. Do you think it was easy for the 12 Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant to step into the already flooding waters of the Jordan in order to obey God? Joshua did not say, okay, uh, when God stops the water, you can carefully walk down into the bank, and then we're going to all pass over. No, God instructed the Levites to step into the water far enough so all 12 of them had their feet firmly in the riverbed, and then the waters would recede. If you remember a guy named Uzzah in Scripture, he's a guy who, or he's the guy, who tried to steady the Ark of the Covenant so it wouldn't fall off the ox cart. Yeah, he died. So imagine being these 12 priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant on your shoulders, and Joshua's like, all right, guys, that overflowing river, I want you to walk down into that river, uh, and once you're all in there, the waters are going to move, I promise. I would be a little nervous carrying literally the presence of the Lord into a flooding river 100 feet long. It's like a 10-story building lying down and 10 feet deep. It's a little nerve-wracking, but they did it. Do you think that was a bit of a struggle? I, I think I would be struggling, right? I'm not sure if you guys have noticed this, but on the outside of this building, there's a stone. Um, it says 1960. As you're walking in, there's a, I guess you can call it a cornerstone, okay? Traditionally, the cornerstone was the first stone laid by the builders, and it was the stone that all others were referenced to. Uh, this stone would have set the direction of all the other bricks. It would set the orientation of the building. Um, often um, items were placed inside or under that stone to commemorate um, the people who were helping build it or what was going on at the time. They would maybe put like some grains or wine or something in there, almost like a time capsule. Well, over, you know, over time, these stones became more ceremonial and ornate, and it's more symbolic. Now, this one here is obviously not the cornerstone because you wouldn't have built, then put a cornerstone, then keep building. But it's, it's still there for a, a ceremonial purpose. It's, it's there for a, something of a memorial. Um, we sometimes hear, joke around sometimes about the building. You know, maybe it's not our, our favorite. Maybe we wouldn't have picked it. But I think that we do that pretty easily because we weren't here in 1960, right? Um, I've only been here for about four and a half years. I know that Restore's been here for about seven. It doesn't even touch 1960, right? So picture this. You know, we were talking about this on Tuesday, actually. Um, we have our staff meetings downstairs on the stage, and, and uh, I think Christy may have said something like, you know, people at Restore, you know, we're going to look back on, on moments like that morning, sitting together on the stage downstairs in our building, talking about, you know, how to keep things going and growing and moving. And we're going to look back fondly on those times together and you know, eating the pastries that Linda brings. And, you know, but, but people will never remember in the future how we got to that place, right? So you know, we're going to look back together on those times fondly and see what God has done. So because Joshua told the men, he said, you know, when you lay the stones down, he goes, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do the stones mean? You're going to tell them. I mean, imagine if you could, being a member of First Presbyterian Church of North Halden, here in 1960, watching that stone be laid, all the excitement and the pride you'd feel for what God was doing, right? How exciting must that have been? We don't know that excitement. We're so far removed from it that we tend to forget. But looking at that stone, at least now that I've written this sermon, when I walk past that stone, that's what I'm thinking about now. I'm thinking about what it must have felt like to have been those people at that time and all that excitement about what God was doing. We have to be reminded sometimes. We forget. If you, if you look back in your mind and you, and you pull out a, like a timeline, look at the timeline of your life. I know that when I look at my timeline, I can definitely see situations where God brought me through difficult things, times, moments, but 
I usually only remember those in hindsight. I don't typically notice that in the moment. It's very hard to see those things sometimes unless you're looking back on them with hindsight. And when you think about that, we, we kind of lose sight of, of where those moments were in our lives that we want to be reminded of. Where are the memorials? Where are those little points in time where you can clearly see God's hand in your life? Things might degrade and change over the years, but that's why it's important we remember. You know, I mean, think about, think about like the, the shiny new facility that it was in 1960 with the brand new lead pipes and all that fun stuff. That was, it was awesome, right? But, but you, you, you go down the years and this things just kind of age and you kind of forget. They kind of fall out of memory and we need to be reminded of that kind of stuff. Things change. That's why you got to remember. And actually, um, as I was reading this passage in Joshua, I was instantly reminded of the book of Judges and our friend Ehud. Now, some of you will remember a couple years ago, we did a series on Judges, and we learned about a guy named Ehud and the king of Moab, who was named Eglon. And it says in the story, but he himself, Ehud, turned back at the idols near Gilgal. That's the same location where Joshua built that memorial when they crossed the Jordan River. Memorials elicit response. When Ehud saw that location, he turned around. Now, I don't want to completely rehash the story, but Ehud's tale in Judges begins like this. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, that's roughly 100 years after that memorial was built at the Jordan River. So 100 years have passed, and we're told at this point that the people again are doing evil in the sight of the Lord. The people forgot as they had the habit of doing, and as we have the habit of doing, and they were oppressed by a foreign king, the king of Moab. Now, it seems that when our hero Ehud passed by that place, he turned around. It would seem that where the memorial had been built was either accentuated with or replaced by idols, by, by pagan idols. But because of the oral tradition and because of his parents and grandparents telling their children about what had happened there, he remembered. Now, my kids are almost eight and five. They were born nine years and almost 12 years after the events of September 11th. They never knew a world that included the Twin Towers in it. And they never lived in a world that wasn't tainted with threats of terror the way it is today. My kids will never see what the skyline looked like with those buildings in it. Down in southern Manhattan, there's a memorial. There's two giant holes in the ground where those towers stood. They were 110 stories each. They were an iconic part of the skyline, and my kids have never seen that. They will see when they go down there, when they visit, they'll see these memorials. They'll see the names of the people who died. The memorial reminds us what happened that morning. That memorial was born out of struggle, to say the least. It was born out of tragedy. That memorial elicits a response. I know a, a lot of men and women who ended up enlisting in the military after 9-11. There's, there's a response that is elicited there. And elicited is not a word I found out, but I'm using it, okay? Elicited. It elicited a response. Our federal government even changed a lot of the ways it operates as, as a response to what had happened. When Ehud saw the place where that memorial stood east of Jericho, he remembered and he responded. It kicked him into action. I often lose sight of God's presence and power in my life. He, he reached down and he rescued me. He rescued us from our common misery. He reconciled us through the death of his son. It, it's important to remember exactly how God provided for us and protects us. It's important to remember, but it's also God remembering us. You know, with Ehud, he turned around in that, at, at that point in time. He, he had planned on, he was raised up to be the deliverer of Israel, and he was supposed to go, and he had plans to assassinate the king. But he didn't do it in those first moments for whatever reason. The, the Bible's clear that he had gone, but when he saw that memorial, that place where the memorial was, that's when he turned around and he completed what he had to do, and actually brought 80 years of peace to Israel at that time. But it's not all just the Israelites or us remembering God. It's also God remembers his people. God remembers us. 
God spoke to Abram. Abram didn't go looking for God. God spoke to Abram. God remembered Noah. God remembered his covenants. God remembered the faithfulness of Israel at times, and God remembers us too. But we don't always feel that way, do we? Sometimes it feels like maybe God forgot. Maybe the, the pressures or the anxieties or whatever you're feeling, it just feels like God is, God's on vacation. God's at his beach house. But look at your timeline. Look, look in your prayer journal if you have one. Look for those places where God was, his hand was clearly moving in that moment, and you may have missed it. Where are your memorials on your timeline? The first Sunday of every month, we here gather together and we take communion. And Jesus tells his disciples to do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. It reminds us of the grace of God that was realized in the sacrifice of his son Jesus. The crucifixion that was required to pay for our sins was tragic, and it was an incredible struggle. Jesus sweat drops of blood asking that the cup be taken from him. The memorial of communion elicits the response of gratitude for what we've been given. God brought Israel through the Red Sea and across the Jordan River into his promise for them. God sent his son to bring us through to God's promise to us, which is eternal life. Tomorrow, as we come together and we remember the sacrifice that many men and women made for us and the sacrifice uh, of Jesus on our behalf, let's reflect on those memorials in our lives um, where God sustained us. Remember that struggle. Act on that. Act on just reflect, reflect on the truth that God remembers his people. We erect these memorials to remember and commemorate sacrifices and events. God's people erected memorials to remember when God remembered them and sustained them. Remember how he rescued you from sin and how he reconciled you, giving you eternal life. When you look at that stone out front, remember that God remembered you. and Remember he sustained you. That's his promise to believers. And that's the gospel. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, um, we would like to just ask you to help us to remember those moments in our life when you were there for us. Help us to remember what you brought us through. Let we not forget all the things that we were caught up in and just, we just ask you that you will continue to encourage us and, and bless us and bring us through and just remind us you're there. Help us to see those memorials in our own timelines and those moments in our prayer journals when you did answer our prayers, you did come through. We ask that you would just be with us as we celebrate those who gave their lives for our country and uh, just be with us as we continue to worship, Father, and just... Uh, we love you so much, and we're so thankful. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.